much for coming to Caltech Astronomy's lecture and stargazing night. So my name is Ivana Scala. I'm a graduate student in the astronomy program here, and I will be your lecture captain for the night. So the schedule of the evening is we will have a 30-minute lecture given, and then following the lecture, we'll have 90 minutes of question and answer um, of a panel composed of a number of different astronomers with varying areas of expertise in the auditorium, and simultaneously we'll have 90 minutes of observing going on outside. So it's a little hazy tonight, but we'll still be able to see a few different objects, such as the moon. Mars is also up tonight, and you can see uh, the Pleiades cluster. So many of you noticed that there were a bunch of uh, cool posters outside, and they have all been grabbed, but we are getting some more interesting astronomy posters if you're interested on your way out. Um, so I'd like to remind you that when you go out for a telescope observing on the field that there is no food, drinks, smoking, pets, and high heels, interestingly enough, because it destroys our fancy uh, turf <laughs> out on the field. So please listen to these rules, otherwise we will not be able to continue having these events. So there are a number of signs outside that are blinking that will direct you on how to get to the telescopes. So you'll just exit through the doors through which you came and go around the building this way. And the field is directly behind us. So there are a number of volunteers present throughout the night that will help you get around the building. Um, most of them are wearing, or maybe some of them, <laughs> are wearing blinking badges, um, so they should be easy to identify. So before we begin, I'd like to remind you of some other events that we have going on. So we have an Astro on Tap event coming up on Monday, December 3rd. So these are informal talks given at a local German beer bar in Pasadena, Der Wulpskopf. Um, for those of you that are 21 and up, you may be interested in attending. And our next lecture in stargazing is on uh, Friday, December 14th, which is titled Making Galaxies on a Supercomputer, so in case you're interested. Uh, with that, I'll introduce our speaker for the evening, Eve J. Lee. So Eve is a Sherman Fairchild postdoctoral scholar in theoretical physics here at Caltech. Um, next summer, she's actually starting as faculty at McGill in Canada. Um, she received her PhD in 2017 from UC Berkeley in astrophysics, and her thesis research has focused on uh, the formation of planetary systems and uh, their diversity as well. So a fun fact about Eve is that in her free time, she likes to Skype her dog, who lives in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> so please welcome Eve. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and thank you everyone for coming out. Um, so as Ivana said, I'm Eve Lee, and I work on theories of planet formation and also their diversity. And for today, I wanted to share with you some very basic properties of these planets. For example, how big they are and how heavy they are, and why do we see this, um, this huge diversity of their size and masses. So for example, even in our own solar system, there's a huge variety of sizes. So here's the scale of the picture of Earth, we live on Earth, and Jupiter. Notice how Jupiter doesn't even fit on the screen. The Earth is about 10 times smaller than the size of the Jupiter. So why is it that some planets, um, these planets come in different sizes? So I'll actually start by giving you the answer because the short answer is a pretty simple one. And the answer is that larger planets just have more gas. So we are living on a rocky planet. Earth is a rocky planet. Uh, we're all standing or sitting on a few thousand kilometer sized rock. And almost the entirety of its mass is locked within this rock. There is some gaseous atmosphere. We're all breathing in some air. But if you actually calculate the total mass budget, it's actually just a part in a million. But if this Earth somehow gathered up much more uh, heavier gaseous atmosphere, so let's say you gathered up about, about like a percent by mass, then this planet is going to blow up by a factor of two. 
And if you gathered up even more gas, so that now the, almost the total mass budget is now in the gas, then it's going to blow up even more and become the gas giants like our own Jupiter. So this idea of larger planets having more gas is, is probably a very intuitive for us to understand because we can see this in everyday example. Like, for example, if you want to lift up a house using a whole bunch of helium balloons and just measure the total volume that's counted up within this huge group of balloons, it's going to be much larger than your house. And uh, if you would like a more grounded uh, example, then, uh, then uh, for example, if you go on a balloon ride, just realize that this helium balloon that's taking you up is much larger than the basket that you're riding inside. So just to give you some numbers, um, so your penny is about 2 centimeters wide, and it weighs about 2.5 grams. And it's mostly made up of zinc, which is composed of 30 protons, 30 neutrons, and 30 electrons. Um, so by, as by astronomers, this is considered a heavy metal. Now if you try to make a helium balloon that weighs just as much as, just as, much as your penny, then you actually need to blow up a balloon that's about 25, 25, 25 centimeters wide in each direction. So again, this picture is to the scale. Notice how the balloon doesn't even fit on the screen. So <coughs> the size difference and the reason why the more large objects, large planets, are made up of more gaseous uh, material, all it boils down to is this idea of density. In other words, you're trying to fill up the same kind of mass using much lighter atom, this helium, which is just two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. So if you try to fill up this balloon with this lighter atoms so that it weighs about the same as this uh, penny, you just need to, you just need to uh, gather up a lot more of this lighter atoms. So what this all means is that if you know the mass and the size of the planets, then we can gain some idea about what exactly these planets are made out of. In other words, what are their chemical compositions? So how do astronomers actually measure the size of the planets? I'll start by giving you the example in the solar system. In the solar system, we're actually living inside of the solar system. So we can actually look and see the solar system planets. And in fact, today, Mars is up in the sky. You guys will be able to see the Mars through a telescope. Um, but this is a Saturn, for example. So what that means is we know the angular size. So if you want to know the physical size, we just need to know the distance towards these objects. So how do we know the distance? All we need to do is we just need to measure the actual distance to one of the planets, and we track each of the solar system planets so that we can gain some idea of how fast they move around the sun, then we just scale up this distance to every other planet. So how do we know, for example, our distance uh, to Mercury? Well, we just uh, shoot radar towards Mercury, and, that, and the signal is going to bounce back towards us, and we just measure the delay in that signal. Now, what about uh, extrasolar planetary system? So, so planets that are outside of our solar systems, those that orbit around stars other than our own sun. We do not have this luxury of actually uh, looking at these planets, uh, actually resolving their angular size. So what we need to do is actually use what's called the transit technique. So all it is is we just uh, look at a group of stars over a period of time, and we just measure how bright they are as a, um, over, over some period. And if this star happens to have a planet, and that planet happens to cross our line of sight, then it's going to block out a certain part of the star, so the star is going to look dimmer. So it's not much different um, other than uh, you going out in the sun. We all live in Southern California. Well, uh, I live in Southern California, uh, so it's really bright outside uh, during the day. So uh, you try to block out the, block out the sunlight using your, using your hands. It's basically the same principle, which in this case, instead of your hands, it's actually a planet that's blocking out some part of the starlight. So the degree of this dip, so if this uh, dip is a little deeper, then that means the planet is, is larger, and it's blocking out a larger portion of the stellar light. 
So, those, so that's the size. And what about the mass of the planets? How exactly do we know how heavy these planets are? So we basically use gravity. Gravity is our friend in this case. So again, starting from the solar system, we have this luxury of being actually able to look at the solar system planets, and not just planets, we can actually look at their moons. So this is Jupiter, and we can actually look at, this is actual um, image through a telescope, we can actually look at some major moons around this Jupiter. So there are four major moons. And because we can actually track the movement of these moons, we know the orbital period, and we also know how far this Jupiter is from, from us, so we also know the orbital distance of these moons. So from that, we can infer the mass of the planet um, uh, because uh, just using the Kepler's third law, which just means gravity. So, so that's four planets where we can actually see the moon, where there actually are moons. What about the planets within our solar systems that do not have any moons? So like uh, Venus or Mercury, for example. So for those, what we do is we use spacecraft. So instead of uh, nature giving us these moons, we just shoot um, our own technology towards those planets. And, and we just track carefully the orbit of the spacecraft around these planets so that we can, so that we can, uh, we can measure how heavy this, uh, plan this planet is, which actually affects the shape of the orbit of the spacecrafts. So again, we, don't, we do not have this luxury for the extrasolar planetary systems. We cannot send any spacecraft to those planets. They're way too far away. And we also, it's also extremely difficult to actually um, infer the existence of the, of the moons around these exoplanets. So we've got to use something else if we want to measure how massive these planets are. So for the masses, we use what's called the radial velocity, or in other words, uh, Doppler spectroscopy. Um, so all it is is there is a planet orbiting around the star, orbiting around the star, and the gravity of this planet actually causes the star to wobble. And as the star wobbles, if the star is traveling towards you, the towards towards the observer, So towards the observer, then as the, as the um, star moves towards you, its light signal is going to be blue shifted. In other words, um, it, the light frequency gets higher. And as the star moves away from you during this wobble, the light signal is going to become red shifted. In other words, the frequency gets lower. So this is the same, um, same physics as the, what you might have heard as, as the Doppler effect. So if you go out there um, on, uh, near the road, and there happens to be a motorcycle or a car just zips by you, then as the car moves towards you, you, see a, you hear a higher pitch, and as the car moves away from you, you hear a much lower pitch. It's the exact same physics here. Okay, so we can measure the radii and masses of this exoplanet and the solar system planets, and we just plot them down on this uh, mass radius diagram. So going towards the right, we're looking at more massive, heavier objects. Going up, we're looking at larger objects. Um, for your information, the, it's a bit hard to see, but the triangles are the solar system planets starting from, uh, starting from Venus. And the magenta points are the exoplanets. Notice how there are very few exoplanets here, and that's because this plot was made all the way back in 2007 where we, actually, we, we did not have uh, much uh, discovered, um, large number of discovered exoplanets. And the curves that we see on this plot are what, are what uh, theorists, like, like myself, the theorists would, uh, uh, would expect to be, uh, where, where we would expect these planets to follow. And you see different colors of these lines, and those, again, correspond to these different chemical compositions. What exactly are these planets made out of? We're going from, we're going from uh, top to bottom. We're looking at more denser objects. In other words, planets that are made out of more heavier atoms. And you might have also noticed that for a given 
chemical composition, the larger the planets, the more massive these planets are. So perhaps that's, again, not very uh, hard to understand intuitively because, uh, for example, your laptop is usually much um, heavier than your cell phone. But, but what exactly is going on? What is the governing physics? So when it comes to um, the life of planets, it's all about balance, the balance of the forces. So this is a planet, a cartoon planet, and there's a gravity that tries to pull the material towards the center, that tries to cause a contraction of this, of this uh, material. But there's also pressure force that tries to push the material outward. And it's the balance of these two forces that keeps the planets intact. And in fact, in this regime for planetary um, sized and mass objects, what exactly provides this pressure force is the electrostatic force. And that is why larger planets are actually heavier. So what is electrostatic force? Or in other words, Coulomb force. So similar to human behavior, um, the basic principles is that opposites attract and likes repel. So atoms, again, are made up of protons, uh, which are positively charged, neutrons, which are neutral, and electrons, which are negatively charged. So, the elect so between atoms, the electrons, this electron cloud, actually attracts the protons of another atom. So if they're just a bit apart from each other, um, this electrostatic force actually um, attracts these atoms together. But you cannot put them too close to each other because protons don't like each other. And you cannot get these uh, atoms closer than about three angstrom, which is about 10 times narrower than a strand of your hair. So because you cannot put them any closer than about three angstrom, which uh, is also uh, called, uh, what physicists call as a Coulomb barrier, um, that actually sets up the density. So this density is set by the atomic mass divided by, um, divided by this area. Um, or divided by this area uh, that's given by this uh, three angstrom uh, Coulomb barrier. So what does this have anything to do with the fact that we see larger planets um, becoming uh, heavier? So think of this structure as like a chain of the atoms where atoms are only about three angstroms apart from each other. Then if you have small planet versus large planet, the large planet just means you have a larger box to pack all these chains together. Um, so you can pack a lot more chains within this larger box. So you just have more atoms, more matter uh, fitted into that larger box. And that is exactly why these larger planets are heavier. So going back to this diagram, you might have noticed that, yes, it's true, um, the, as the planets get larger, it becomes heavier and heavier. But at some point, um, theorists tell, 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 tell you and tell us that it should actually taper off and maybe even fall down, where if the mass becomes, the object becomes so massive that it's actually no longer a planet, it's, it's, um, it's more like a star or actually failed stars like brown dwarfs, then actually smaller objects become heavier and in this case, it's no longer electrostatic force that provides this pressure that fights against the gravity. It's actually what's called the electron degeneracy force. Um, so it's a very interesting um, uh, property to think of, but because it's not related to, it's not really related to planets, and this lecture is about planets, I'm going to skip that. But if you're interested, I'm more than happy to chat more about it after the lecture. OK. So again, this plot was made all the way back in 2007. But we currently live in 2018. So we better update this plot. And in fact, just within this small region, we can fit that region with about 100 planets. <laughs> um, in total, there's about, uh, about 4,000 um, uh, can exoplanet candidates. And it's just a small subset of that 4,000 because uh, these are all the planets where we have very well measured both uh, radii and masses. <coughs> so um, it's a bit hard, to, again, hard to see, but Earth actually sits down here. Um, and Neptune sits over here. 
And again, this range of the radii is basically driven by how much gas these planets have. So Earth, again, um, its gaseous atmosphere is only one part in a million when it comes to total mass budget. And for Neptune, the, the total uh, gas mass budget is about 10%. But if you look at the entire exoplanetary systems, most exoplanets actually fall right between these two, what we call as the super-Earths. So their radii and masses um, tell us that their atmospheric uh, mass budget is actually about a percent. And universe is just so full, it's just abound with this uh, super Earth type objects. So, so what does that mean when it comes to the formation of these planets? Why are these um, super Earths so common? And why do they all have this uh, few percent uh, biomass envelope? And what does this variation tell us about when, how, and where exactly this planet's form? So overall, planets form in a disk of gas and dust around a central star. And within this disk, we first have uh, what's called the coagulation of the dust. All it means is that dust particles stick to each other, like dust bunnies. Um, and then they stick to each other even more and then compress so, they, so that they become larger pebbles, like a centimeter-sized pebbles, and then to meter-sized boulders, and then to about kilometer-sized planetesimals, and then eventually up to a few thousand kilometer-sized planetary cores. And once you have this planetary cores, they are now massive enough, heavy enough, that they can actually gather some gas within this disk around the star. And that gas will become the planetary atmospheres. But while this core is, is gobbling, up, uh, gobbling up those gas, actually most of this disk gas um, gets funneled onto the central stars. It just gets drained onto the star, while some other gas gets blown away by the wind generated by the central star. So what that means is over time, over the disk lifetime, this disk is slowly getting rid of its own gas. So when people study planet formation, we always have to put it into the context of the disk lifetime. So here's a cartoon of how exactly this uh, disk evolved. Like what, is the, what, what does the life of this disk look like? So ER0, this forms, it's full of gas and dust. And over time, over 10 million years, it slowly sheds its gas, and eventually this gas is all gone. And all you're left with is just some uh, solid material and your planets. So if this planetary core is formed early, when there's full of gas and dust, then there's enough time to create lots of gas, and this planet is going to become gas giant, like our own Jupiter, which again is 10 times larger than our own planet Earth. But the universe is actually abound with a smaller objects, the super-Earths. So when exactly would super-Earths form? So if the cores form really late, just as the disk gas goes away, then there's only a fraction of the disk lifetime to gather the gas, gather its planetary atmosphere. And there's also not enough gas to begin with because the disk is also shedding its own gas. So if cores form late, then there's not enough time, nor gas to become gas giant, so you end up with the super-Earth, with just a few percent by mass uh, envelope. Okay, what about our own planet Earth? We only have one part in a million when it comes to the, um, the gaseous atmosphere. So our own planet Earth is most likely formed way after all the disk gas is gone, and this tiny little bit of atmosphere that we breathe actually comes from the rock <coughs> that we're standing on. Okay, so again, this is another updated pl plot of the radius versus mass diagram. Um, great thing about this kind of plot is that we can always pick out some weird objects. So notice how most of these planets fall on this line where we see larger planets becoming more massive, uh, more heavier. But there are these weird three objects up here, which I call as the super puffs, because they're way too large for their tiny masses. 
So in fact, if we just calculate their uh, bulk densities, they're as dense as like marshmallows and cotton candies. <laughs> so where do these uh, super puffs objects form? And how do they form? So in order to explain their huge puffiness, they must have a lot of gaseous envelope on top. In fact, if you look at their total mass budget, the gas needs to cover about 30 to 50%. So where does it get all this, all this gas? Um, so we need to understand the basics of how exactly these planets um, accrete, accrete gas and build this atmosphere. So initially, you have a core sitting in, this, uh, sitting in this disk of gas and dust. And there's atmosphere that's bound within the Hill sphere. So Hill sphere is some um, like imaginary sphere where the gas inside which the gas will be bound by the gravity of the core um, against the tidal acceleration from the star. So just, um, so just think of it as like a boiling uh, pot of water. And that water is filled all the way to the brim. But over time, this gas is going to cool and contract, which leaves some empty room for the ambient gas to refill. Just like in the case of a boiling pot of water, if you just uh, turn off the stove, then this, uh, then this water cools and it's going to simmer down within the pot, and that leaves more empty room for you to fill in with even more water. So basically, if you want this course to gather up as much gas um, and as fast as possible to build this super puff object, then you've got to make sure that these envelopes, this, uh, this gas, cools as fast as possible. So what, do I, what does it mean when it comes to the cooling of the gas? All it means is you are going to transport away the energy outside of these planets. So most of the energy is locked within this inner area of this of these planets, and you just want to shed that away. So how exactly does that happen? There are multiple modes of energy transport. In this inner regions of the planetary atmospheres, it's given by convection. We see this even in our own Earth atmosphere. Warm air rises, cool air falls. Um, it's the same thing. And once you get it outside of this uh, outer regions of the atmosphere, then the energy gets transported away by radiation. In other words, light um, gets the energy out. So what's really important when it comes to convection is the properties of its lid. It's this thermal boundary, radiated convective boundary, that controls the rate of cooling. And if you want to create those super puffs, what you need to do is you just need to cool off this boundary. So you want these planets to form far away from the star where the disk is cooled. So I just threw up a lot of words at you. Um, and uh, any, any physics is much easier to understand if you just look at everyday example. So I actually made a video demo. And I hope it works. Ah, great. OK, so this is a hot tea. And I'm going to pour some cream on, into it, where I'm going to use this cream as a tracer of this convective motion. So you see the rising of the wisp of the cream. And over time, it's going to fall back down. So that's basically convection. And I'm just going to wait for it to settle down a bit so that I control the temperature of this lid to see what exactly happens. Again, uh, this part is all convection at the top. So I just placed the metallic lid on top, so it's much easier for me to control the temperature by putting ice cubes on top of it. So that's one ice cube. And I just placed the second ice cube. And you'll notice that just by putting the ice cube, you see this rise, a re-rise of the cream. So it just reinvigorates the convection. And in fact, uh, that's the third ice cube. Within just a few seconds, the cream and tea mixture is almost completely mixed. And I assure you, I didn't do anything else other than just placing ice cubes on top. So again, um, so basically, if you want to make sure there's any kind of uh, mixture or cools off by convection, all you need to do, just cool off that boundary. 
Um, so connecting that to the super puffs, you just want to make sure that the super puffs are from far out uh, from the star. All right, so since we're talking about exoplanets, um, it's always fun to think about, can we live on this planet? Are these planets habitable? Um, so the short answer is no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I'll just go through, um, but like why exactly, right? So why exactly is it that we cannot live on these planets? Um, so what's really important when it comes to whether we can live on these planets or not is what are the conditions at the surface of, of, uh, of these planets? So what are the conditions at this uh, core atmosphere boundary? Um, so these are some example of atmospheric structures, of uh, pressure versus temperature. And one thing to, the first thing to note here is that it's, it's a very high pressure environment. It's about 10,000 atmospheres, so it's about 10,000 times uh, more pressure than the pressure that we feel right now. And in fact, this is about 10 times higher pressure than the pressure that you would feel if you were at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest part of the ocean bottom. Um, but maybe you can survive. If you're uh, deep ocean creatures, like the super crustaceans or this ghost fish down here. But even then, it's going to be very difficult because not only is it a high pressure environment, it's also really hot. It's about 10,000 Kelvin. Um, so at 10,000 Kelvin, not even thermophiles, which are the bacteria, like uh, tiny bacteria kind of creatures that live in hot springs, for example, like in Yellowstone. Um, so these kind of environment, it's about a few hundred Kelvin. So the bottom of the super earth and super puffs is basically about 20 to 50 times hotter than the hot springs. Um, so no, you cannot live on super earth or super puffs. Um, so if you want to find the next uh, planet that you might be interested in colonizing, then uh, what you need to do is basically look for the smaller planets where there's not much gas on top so that this, uh, this surface uh, environment is, uh, is much less hostile. Thank you. So, oh. so we have time for a few questions. So the question is, around how heavy is a super puff? Ah, so it's about um, anywhere from twice to four times as heavy as our planet Earth. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, um, can you explain the electromagnetic force? Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, so basically what happens is, let's see if I can actually pull it up. Um, anyways, I'll just explain it. So anyways, uh, what happens is uh, now the planet is so massive, you basically, uh, it's so heavy under its own gravity that the electrostatic uh, repulsion is, is not, it's just not able to balance that uh, gravitational contraction. So you, have, you basically effectively squeeze the material, right? And if you just squeeze those atoms together, you can effectively overcome the Coulomb barrier that I talked about. So by squeezing, you actually um, sort of like the picture that you can think of is you pop out the electrons. Um, and those electrons, uh, there's actually, it's set by quantum mechanics, what's called the uncertainty principle. Um, this, its position uh, can, cannot be larger than certain amounts set by quantum mechanics. So there's a relationship between um, how fast they can be, like how large their momentum is, versus uh, what, what is the spatial scale they can occupy. Um, so that is the reason why. So basically, all it means is that you squeeze it in a, you squeeze it even more, then the electrons just like just goes crazy and uh, it it uh, it's the scatters off even more. Um, so it's that uh, high scattering that basically gives you that pressure force. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, okay. At the front. Um, so if the planet, so there's actually something interesting happens if, the, so let's say the core is about an Earth mass and it gathered about, again, like an Earth mass gas, then it basically undergoes what we call as a runaway gas accretion. 
um, so it accretes so it accretes gas at even faster and faster rate. So the growth of the growth of the planet is accelerating. So that's actually the reason why you have this gas giant, which makes sure that uh, you're going to end up with the with a planet whose total mass budget is um, is basically just all in gas, rather than its rocket core. Uh, at the back. Electro. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's uh -huh. Yeah, so that, that relation is basically governed by the electrostatic force. And what um, is so, electrostatic uh, So what it basically means is it's the, um, the attraction between the differently charged particles. So we're all made up of atoms. And atoms are made up of, uh, of protons, which are positively charged particles, and then the electrons, which are negatively charged particles. So it's the, um, so it's the force between those uh, charged particles. Um, so basically, the likely charged particles repel each other, and the oppositely charged particles, uh, um, basically, they, they like each other, so they attract. One more question. So, uh, <laughs> Sorry, uh, at the back. Oh, is it me? Yes. Oh, me. Um, actually, two questions. <laughs> 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 um, I was wondering how you remotely observe um, mass and radius of these times. And also, the second part is just how do you define the radius of the, the, the times? Like, where is the value of the atmosphere? Yeah, right. So, that's a really good question. So, I'll start by answering the second question. Um, so, um, so as I mentioned, for exoplanet systems, we, we measure its radii by using the transit method. So all it is is we just uh, look at how much of the light gets blocked by the planet. But that actually says something really interesting about the atmosphere of the planet. Um, so depending on what the atmosphere is actually made out of, its size can look very different, um, depending on what wavelength you look at this star. Um, so basically, if you can think of, uh, so for if you try to connect this to Earth, for example, we cannot see past the clouds, right? So we can basically think of as some, what we call as an optically thick material, just think of it as clouds. Um, so it's basically set by where the clouds are. Sorry, you had a first question. Uh, Yeah. Um, right. So the mass, um, again, the basic uh, principle is, again, gravity. So the gravity of the planet actually causes the wobble of the star. And by wobble, what I mean is both the star and the planet orbits the center of mass. Um, and the more massive the planet is, the more uh, distant the center of mass is going to be from the star. Um, so, you, so there's a wobble, and you try to look at the spectra of the star. So stars, so stars' own atmosphere is made up of some um, chemical compositions, and that chemical composition uh, causes this uh, features uh, within a spectra. Um, so basically, how bright the star is as a function of wavelengths. Um, so I suggest that we take this discussion till uh, a few minutes. Okay, thank you very much. So. Um, I will be the moderator for the panel, and we have a few of the panelists here who have written their names and some of their areas of expertise behind them, so I'll allow them to all introduce themselves briefly. Hi, I'm Nikita. I'm a graduate student here at Caltech, currently in my third year. Um, my advisor is Fiona Harrison, uh, who's basically in charge of this really cool telescope called New Star, which is an X-ray telescope up in space. And my main area of research are, is active galactic nuclei, which are these uh, really massive black holes um, that we find in some galaxies. So if you have any questions about black holes or AGN or x-rays, please ask me. Hi, I'm Marianne. I'm a postdoc here. 
Um, I work in the same group as Nikita does, but I don't really use X-rays. I use the big optical and infrared telescopes that Caltech has, uh, like the Keck Observatory on Hawaii and Palomar in, here in Southern California. And I also look at black holes, but then the smaller ones. So they're mainly, well, so black holes and some neutron stars that are basically field black holes um, that we find in our own galaxy and in a few neighboring galaxies. Um, I'm Ryan. I'm a first year grad student here, so I've been here for a couple of months. Um, I'm working with uh, Professor Andrew Howard here, who's an exoplanet hunter. So we use the radial velocity or Doppler method that was mentioned in the, the talk today, um, using the, the Keck telescope in Hawaii to search for these very small wobbles in planets and trying to find them and then measure how heavy they are and combine that with radius measurements to, to find out what these planets are made of and what kind of planets are common. So do we have our first question for the panel? Ooh, I think your hand went up first in the back. Did you say other than a supermassive black? Okay, so the, the largest black hole that you've studied that's not supermassive. Okay, so um, it depends a little bit on where you draw the line between supermassive black holes and non-supermassive black holes. So the ones that we study that are definitely non-supermassive black holes are the ones we call well stellar mass, and those are the ones that you make by basically having a massive star sort of die, explode in a supernova, or not explode in a supernova, and collapse into a black hole. And those can, so they can go, we think, up to about 100 solar masses. We measure everything in solar masses because kilograms would make no sense. Um, <laughs> so the smallest one that we know is about five times the mass of our sun. The biggest one that we've seen is the merging ones that LIGO detected. So the very first one that LIGO saw, they, they had two black holes. One was about, I think, 25 solar masses. The other one was about 35 solar masses, and it combined into a single, uh, like, 60 solar mass black hole. And I may be off by a few solar masses here. But something like that. That's the biggest one that we know of. We think they can go up to 100. And then there's this other class of objects that we call intermediate mass black holes. That's everything basically in between the stellar mass ones and the supermassive ones. And we haven't really seen any of those. I mean, there have been claims uh, that few people really believe. Um, we're looking really hard because we think that you need them to make the supermassive black holes to begin with. Uh, but we haven't actually seen any of those. The one. <laughs> So the one that I would maybe put into that category is about 100,000 solar masses, but I think most people would just call that a small supermassive black hole. It depends, yeah. So a lot of um, indications for dark matter come from things like the rotation curves of galaxies and things like that, where um, the thing is the, the velocities at which galaxies 
if you look at, say, a disk of a galaxy and things like that, are rotating, are too fast to, um, too fast for just the luminous matter that is present in the galaxy. So if you try to come up with an estimate of the mass just based on everything you can see, it is much too small based on what we know about gravity to be to have that rotation occurring, right? Because the, the more massive a galaxy is, the faster something will have to rotate around it to prevent from um, falling inward toward the galaxy. So uh, that tends to be pretty good evidence for dark matter from the galaxy side of things. Um, if you are concerned about dark matter, there are also indications of its existence in something known as the cosmic microwave background. Um, so what this is, is essentially uh, the radiation that is free streaming through the universe from very, very early on when the universe transitioned from being opaque to being transparent. So when the universe was very young, it was extremely hot and dense. Um, you can kind of think of it almost like, say, uh, the sun or the star. You can't see through the sun, right? I mean, it takes about 10,000 years or so for the light from the center of the sun to make its way out to the surface. So the early universe was a little bit like that. But when... modified Newtonian gravity, or MOND. Hello? Okay. Um, and one of the best talk titles that I've ever seen was called MOND over Matter. <laughs> For, so the, the battle between MOND and dark matter. Um, and so this is like trying to tweak the equations of Newton's gravity or Einstein's gravity to make dark matter appear in some way. Um, but none of these theories can also simultaneously reproduce 
many other observable properties of the universe, which things like general, rel general relativity absolutely nail. So, yeah, and relativity is one of the best tested theories that we have, and um, the, the ultimate test of a, uh, some sort of alternative gravity theory would also have to answer and account for all of those other things that these other theories that have lasted up 100 plus years have been able to explain, so. Yeah, I think the main, the main issue is that as soon as you have a, a Mond, Mondian theory that, um, that explains all the things that dark matter explain, you basically have something that is dark matter. I think that's, that, that's sort of, and we don't know what it is, and that's an issue, but we'll find it eventually. Add that like it's not true to say that we we don't have evidence for it there. Um, like you know we touched upon what Ivana was mentioning earlier with the rotation curves of galaxies and. Well, I was like, yeah, based on what we know, but what if we don't know? You know, you said um, you said based on what we know about gravity, it's spinning too fast. But what if we don't? You know, what if we? Well, so so the point is the, the the point is, yes, you can make a theory of gravity that explains the rotation curves of the galaxies without dark matter. But then there's also what Ivana said, the the CMB. We have evidence from galaxy clusters where you see so those are, these are like enormous clusters of galaxies that are colliding, and you can actually sort of tell where the matter is, and it's not where the gas and the galaxies are. So there's a whole bunch of matter there that we don't see that's not interacting with anything else, but we know it's there. There's, there's tons of different, very different kinds of evidence for something there that we don't see. And Mont, just as far as I have seen, doesn't explain it yet. I mean, they're trying. Um, so, yeah, I'm not too familiar with what you're specifically saying about like superheating above black holes, but at least the kind of black holes I studied, like many of them have an accretion disk around them. So there's like material actively falling onto the black hole and being sucked into the black hole. And you do have heating and thermalization um, in the vicinity of the black hole. What happens beyond the event horizon, nobody really knows, but... It's open to theory. I was talking about like there's a, a really good example work by the Dutch Center, and he was talking about this one kind of distance above the event horizon that was superheated, this blanket that's basically around the black hole. And you can't talk about how we vapor, vaporize <laughs> and just kind of, I just don't know. <laughs> so I was. I think. This is called the firewall thing. Well, not thing, obviously. <laughs> but I, th I think, as far as I remember, this has something to do with explaining why information is lost in black holes. And then someone came up with a firewall that somehow destroys information. But I have to admit, uh, I, am, I, I just don't know. Uh, it's a nice idea. We'll never be able to test it, probably. I, I think this is the thing about, like, what happens with information theory, information loss and gain once you pass the event horizon. There's a lot of different theories of quantum gravity, this and that. They're just theories at the end of the day. And there's no way to, that we can really test them. <laughs> no bias here. Yeah, exactly. Um, so in order to see, you know, the planet pass in front of its star, it has to be 
you know, the orbital plane that it's embedded in needs to be angled exactly so that it crosses our line of sight. Um, and if you have that configuration and you've seen a transit, you can combine that information to even better constrain the properties you would measure from a Doppler shift. So combining those two techniques can be really powerful in getting precise measurements of the planet properties. So you can know, um, if you've seen a transit, you know, like, multiple, with multiple of those dimmings, you know exactly how frequent its orbit happens. So what is the orbital period? Like, how long is a year on that planet? And then you can translate that into your measurements uh, of, like, the Doppler shift, and you know exactly how periodic those variations in the star's wobbles should be and exactly where they should happen, and that can help you get really, really precise measurements. Yeah, this is, so this is actually one of the main questions that my research group tries to answer is what is the diversity of planets and how does that depend on what kind of stars they orbit or if there's multiple planets in a system, how are their properties going to be correlated, um, and those kind of things. And so there are about thir like 3,800-ish planets discovered right now. Only some fraction of them also have mass determinations. Um, I think probably a, about a third-ish or fewer even. Um, so the sample that we have to sort of study these patterns is relatively small, but we can already see some pretty interesting things appearing. So one is um, stars that have uh, what's called, what astronomers call a higher metallicity, which to astronomers, anything that's heavier than hydrogen or helium is called a metal. It's just how, <laughs> how the nomenclature is. Um, so, but stars that have a higher fraction of those heavier elements tend to have more diverse planets. So they'll host smaller planets and larger planets, um, sort, of, sort of more mixed about than a star that doesn't have those, as much of those heavier elements. So you could kind of think of that being, you need a star that has those building blocks that are able to create heavier mass planets. And in order for that, you need like heavier metals or something like that. Um, and then also another interesting sort of pattern that's popped out um, is small planets seem to come in two very distinct populations. One we call the super-Earths, um, which are rocky planets with a very small or effectively negligible atmosphere. Um, and then the sub-Neptunes, which are rocky cores with much larger atmospheres. And in between, there's not, uh, there's like a relative um, like gap of no planets sort of with this intermediate size that have been found. Um, and this is a really tricky business because our detection methods are only sensitive to certain kinds of planets. So transiting planets, you have to be exactly aligned. You have to see this thing pass multiple times. So if you only have an experiment running for three or four years, you're not going to see any planets with orbits longer than that. Um, uh, the, the Doppler method, you, re, you, um, you need heavier planets that are further out because a smaller planet like the size of the Earth is just going to have such a small effect on its star that you can't really measure that shift. And so all of these different um, sort of measurement biases affect the types of planets that you can see, and you have to sort of correct that out to sort of estimate what the sort of general uh, diversity of planets is. Um, but yeah, so the, the, even with sort of the small samples that we're seeing, you can kind of group them into uh, some certain different classes, and then uh, the job that we give to the theorists is explain why this happens. <laughs> Well, with the caveat that we use our, the, the metal content of our sun as a, a reference. So when, when we measure the heavy element content 
in any other star, it's always relative to the sun. Um, so it, it depends on where you're looking, actually. So if you look in, say, the interior of a very, maybe a more massive spiral galaxy like Andromeda, for example, which is thought to be at least two times more massive than the Milky Way, you have uh, stars that are much more metal rich than the sun that are present there. There are also stars that are more metal rich than the sun in the interior of our own galaxy if you go toward the center. As you tend to go toward the outskirts, especially if you get away from the disk of a galaxy, you start to get uh, stars that are much, much more metal poor. So you get stars that are more metal poor by a factor of 10 or 100 or even more than that. Um, so when you look at, say, dwarf galaxies that orbit the Milky Way, and, and most of the galaxies closest to us in our local group of galaxies are actually dwarfs, um, many of them, on average, their metal content is around um, 10 to 100 times lower than the metal content of the sun. So I, mean, I do uh, some research in this area. So compared to the stars I normally work with, the sun is <laughs> rich in metals. <laughs> So the, the mechanism is essentially that you have, uh, one, you have more vigorous star formation occurring in the centers of galaxies than uh, toward the outskirts. Um, so if you have more star formation occurring, we're going to have more supernova explosions and the light going off. So when we measure the heavy element content of stars, we normally do it based on iron content. We use iron as a proxy for the total heavy element content. So iron is mostly produced by a specific type of supernova explosion. So if you, uh, in order to have supernova, you need to have star formation that was occurring. And to have a lot of supernova going off, you needed to have um, extended star formation and active star formation. So for example, in these little dwarf galaxies, you don't really tend to have that as much, partly because they are, um, they are not nearly as massive. So one thing they can do is they can uh, stop their own star formation. If you have some supernova explosions go off in them, there is not enough uh, gravity due to the low mass of the galaxy to retain a lot of the gas. So you have supernova go off, and they essentially blow all the fuel out of the galaxy and, you know, can't make any more stars, can't make any more metals. Um, so, and you also lose a lot of metals in that process that may have already been formed because they fly out of the galaxy along with the gas. So that is a brief explanation of why, you know, you tend to have a variety of... Uh, different heavy element contents in systems. So there's a, a really neat relation um, of, uh, called the mass metallicity relation of galaxies, where how much heavy elements a galaxy has is proportional to um, how massive it is. So more massive galaxies have more metals for these reasons.
so part of the trick in astronomy is trying to explain what sort of things that you observe in this data. So I'm not 100% sure or familiar with this ex particular example. Um, I would hesitate to jump to the it's definitely aliens thing, even though it's fun to think about. But um, yeah, so there's it could be a number of uh, different possibilities. There could be a, a circumstellar disk of dust and material that causes you know different amounts of light to be able to get through at different times. That has to you know, also explain why you would only see this weird behavior happen in sort of patterns, which would mean it's probably tethered to some object that's moving around the star. Um, so a sort of different example that's not uh, the Tabby star, um, but also had this very strange behavior where, you know, a couple times you would see this dip, but it wasn't exactly, as you would say, just like a perfect down and back up again. It would go down, it would go all the way back up, it would go to 50%, it would go up, it would go all the way down to 100%, and it would be insane. Um, and what actually, uh, uh, so this is around an object with some long telephone number name called like J1407B-7 blah, 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 whatever. Um, but what, what actually um, was a really good uh, model that fit this observation was a Saturn-sized planet with a ring, or I think it's a Ju Saturn-Jupiter-sized planet with a, a extremely extended ring system. That the ring system was about as large across as the Earth-Sun distance. Yeah, I think I remember. Uh, I think I remember learning about that. It was, uh, rings are not really that common, but it was that exception that was just gigantic, right? Yeah, and yeah, and so you would have these gaps in the rings, possibly where moons are forming, where you could have some light pass through. But as the rings are moving in front, you would dim the light back out again, and you it would sort of create this very strange behavior in the light that you would see from the star. Um, I think the the rings were supposed, like the, the model would, um, the amount of material in this rings would be about an Earth mass in ring material. So this planet could, you know, if that all condensed into a moon, you would have something like an Earth-sized moon orbiting this planet. Um, and this is actually uh, the way that the planet Uranus was first discovered, was seeing uh, sort of the transit of the planet Uranus in front of a background star and watching this dim, or um, and the dim uh, also blocked out on two sides of the central planet dip, and that's how they figured out that Uranus has rings. Well, yeah, I mean, black holes drift through space the same way the sun drifts through space. Um, they're pretty rare, though. I mean, given that, as far as we know, our sun hasn't collided with another star, the chances of it colliding with a black hole are much, much lower. Well, it, it would definitely mess up stuff, but I doubt it would turn Venus upside down. I'm not entirely sure. I think it would just disrupt everything, actually, rather than have these specific, um, but I mean, the galaxy is actually pretty empty when it comes to stars, right? I mean, the nearest star is what, a parsec away, so let's say three light years. Um, black holes make up probably around maybe one in, what was it, 10,000 or something stars turns into a black hole. So there's probably some like relatively close by that we haven't found yet, but, but as, Our yeah. Well, <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 that was colliding neutron stars, yes. So neutron stars themselves don't really create elements, they're just sort of a soup of stuff. We don't actually know, we think it's neutrons, it might be a giant ball of neutrons. So if you have two giant balls of neutrons and you clash them together, then you can get all kinds of cool stuff. Um, we call these, uh, yeah, so, so you, make, you make kind of funky elements because you you make these, well, yeah, balls of neutrons, basically. So, so really, really heavy elements like plutonium and stuff like that, they're just really heavy cores and they're not stable for that reason. Um, and you can make those by basically just 
keep adding on neutrons and if you but you need a lot of neutrons to make something like that because it's extremely unstable right so it keeps on falling apart and doing weird stuff so so to get that many neutrons onto uh, onto an element you need a lot of them so then colliding neutron stars are probably a good place well, I'm not sure if it's new it's just the first time we actually saw it so um, yeah so so they think or they think they saw um, like um, features in the spectra that show that definitely some heavy elements were created. So I think they started out with saying all the gold in our galaxy is, it comes from these things. I don't think that's still true, um, but I'm not entirely sure actually. Yeah, so it was um, theorized for a long time, like since say at least the early 2000s that neutron star mergers could be a source of these really heavy elements like gold, for example. But it was unclear how much they actually contributed. It, originally, um, I think it was thought that they were a fairly minor source, and most people thought that these really heavy elements that need a lot of neutrons in them were coming from um, core collapse supernova explosions. But uh, the thing is, these, these systems are difficult to model because they involve a lot of like crazy high energy astrophysics. But you know, people still try and, and they would model these core collapse supernova explosions. And then over, over the decades, people started to realize that, um, you know, they'd make their model of this explosion, they'd make their model of which elements were formed, and it couldn't account for the uh, really heavy elements that we actually saw around us in the universe. So they started to look at neutron star mergers as an additional source, um, if not a, a primary source of some of these really heavy elements. But as Marianne said, they weren't actually uh, directly detected until recently. One of the main uncertainties there is also just the rates, like the, the number of these neutron star mergers that happens per galaxy, per time scale. And we still don't really know. We've seen one, and it's, well, statistics with one is very tricky. But we hope that LIGO Virgo will actually solve this in a couple next couple of years. We'll, we'll see more or not, and then that will tell us whether it's important. So for anyone that uh, might not be familiar with what the Fermi paradox is, this is basically, um, you know, the universe is a big place, the galaxy is a really big place, there's 100 billion stars, and it's probably unlikely that the Earth is the only place in the galaxy that life has come about and that it's developed to intelligence. And so given the 10 plus billion year history of the galaxy, it's likely that another civilization has come about somewhere in the galaxy and you know, could transmit uh, radio signals, for example, like we do with our televisions or uh, satellites, um, or you know, traverse the whole galaxy. Like 10 billion years is a really long time, and 100 billion stars is a really big number. So the question is, why don't we see? You know, where are the aliens? You know, what, why, um, why have we not detected these other signals? Um, and I don't think it's for a lack of looking, <laughs> um, because a lot of effort is put into like SETI, so search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, I don't know. One, uh, there's a couple sort of depressing possibilities as to why we don't see any aliens, and one is that an intelligent civilization becomes unstable and is likely to destroy itself. I don't particularly like that. <laughs> um, Another is maybe it's just really rare. Maybe, um, uh, so, so yeah, so the two possibilities are life has evolved to intelligence in the past, but it hasn't either lived as long to where we are now to be visible or either decided not to be visible. Maybe they just don't want to communicate or maybe we are the first. Um, 
I don't know. Both up, both possibilities are equally crazy. <laughs> Yeah, um, so one of the, the diagrams that Eve had showed earlier was sort of that mass and radius, and there are, were sort of lines drawn on it for, like, if you built a planet out of this composition, so out of Earth-like material, you would have a line that goes like this, and there are a bunch of planets that sort of seem to follow that trend. There are others that are sort of less dense for their mass that are sort of follow a line as if they were um, composed with a large fraction of water, so these are the ones that you sometimes hear are called like water worlds. Um, and then there are even others that are anomalously dense that are f much more massive than should be allowed for their radius if it were just sort of Earth-like, which sort of means maybe it's got uh, a much higher iron abundance and maybe it's just a giant ball of iron or something like that. Um, so... There are lots of crazy planets out there, and the goal is to, to try to measure as many of them as we can and sort of see what trends pop out. You mean like... A, yeah, well, so, so it would be likely for a planet to have a more dense core just from that heavier material sinking to the center, so um, iron being one of the, the heavier and also uh, relatively abundant uh, materials to build a planet out of would, would be very common, yeah. Yeah, um, what are your astrological signs? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan raises the hackles of an astronomer and then asking that question. Uh, but the last time he asked the same question, it was a diff now it's a different panel, so I'm gonna ask it again. Um, it's really more about a science education question. Uh, amongst my students, and mind you, it's only a sample of one class, but amongst my students, I ask them, how many of you like science? All hands go up. All other subjects are not even a close second. Science is by far their favorite subject. I teach or taught fifth grade. But I've also noticed that around about hmm, seventh or eighth grade, science does the Thelma and Louise and drives off a cliff. As a seventh and eighth grade science teacher, screw you. <laughs> 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 so to be honest, so I didn't, I'm not from the U.S., I grew up in the Netherlands. We didn't really have any science classes in primary school, apart from what our teacher could, could do herself or himself. It was really, it was not such a big, I don't remember doing very much at all. I, I think one of the, the biggest things is sort of taking away the, the why is science interesting from the sort of school experience and replacing that with, you know, here's a bunch of facts about, you know, the Earth's crust and its mantle and stuff, and now you need to know, like, X, Y, Z, and then repeat this on a test and get a good grade and move on. And it sort of becomes less interesting and more of just trying to you know, memorize things or just sort of know lots of different things instead of thinking more about, you know, why is, you know, the world the way that it is and sort of exploring that curiosity more than just sort of a fire hose of information and then asking people to repeat that information. Again, I didn't grow up under the U.S. education system, but I think this is a very... Uh, curriculum specific and also teacher specific problem um, you know like what Ryan was saying you're, you're transitioning from a phase of you know 
like why does this happen why does that happen to you need to know this for this exam and that for that exam what kind of teacher you have you know highly influences your pursuit of science in the future and especially me being a woman in physics um, how it impacts you know girls and how to get them continuing staying in science and not you know putting them off science because they don't have enough role models they didn't have a good enough teacher that really like instilled a sense of interest in so it really there are a lot of factors in play one is the curriculum the education system and also like how good of a science teacher are you actually <laughs> so um how about all the way in the back you yeah we haven't heard from you yet Yeah, so why is information loss and black holes such a big deal? I mean, this is like a big enigma in, in you know, the theorist world of, of information loss and uh, what happens to information inside a black hole. I mean, I've, I've been even having like conversations with people in my research group about if if matter is falling into a black hole and we know what its angular momentum is before it entered the black hole and then we can measure changes in angular momentum of the black hole, then isn't that a, a violation of information theory? Um, I don't think I have a really good answer for how to deal with... There's just a lot of theories out there. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the main issues, at least for us here, I am not entirely sure what people mean when they say that information is lost. I just I think that the, the like the people who make these theories have a very have a slightly different concept of what that means than what I understand when I hear that. Um, so yeah, I can't really say anything useful. So uh, it, I don't think it's lost. Just when it goes into a black hole, it gets turned into a infinite amount of bookshelves and books containing all the knowledge of the universe and then you have to tap on them to send a message back to your daughter. Well, I don't actually, I don't think there's a distinction in that case. And I don't know if the problem with, with black hole information has to do with the fact, like, you, I guess you could conceive that somehow it's contained within the black hole, at least is my understanding of it. I know one thing that is problematic about the information is uh, Hawking radiation. So um, if you have material, whatever it is, falling into a black hole, and then if you actually do have the black hole radiating at some point, information becomes a problem because the outgoing radiation doesn't at all reflect, say, any of the properties or any of the information that was part of the infalling material. So I think that's one of like the very specific information loss problems and I feel like we need quantum gravity in order to solve these things but <laughs> quantum gravity is just another theory that people try to propose to reconcile things but it's just another theory
Well, uh, neutron stars are uh, what is known as degenerate objects, which means that they are uh, supported by, so, so Eve talked a little bit about this at the end of her talk. So they're supported by the fact that, um, say when you have an atom and things like that, you have electrons and neutrons and things like that, and they each have a different quantum state. And by the laws of quantum physics, they cannot have the same quantum state as the other. Like, they cannot occupy the same space as one another. So when you start to get at, to these really extremely high densities, um, you start to have objects that are supported by this degeneracy pressure coming from um, quantum physics. And... Uh, when you have more mass that's falling onto these degenerate objects, you have the objects getting smaller. So the relationship between the radius of the object and the mass is um, it's negatively correlated. Because in order to keep on supporting itself, it needs to become even more compacted to have the degeneracy pressure balance um, the force of gravity of the object. So I don't... So for neutron stars, their radii, I think, are actually approximately constant. Approximately, yeah. So they're around, I think, is it like 10 kilometers or so? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, approximately. I mean, it's not like, okay, maybe between like 10 and 15 kilometers, but... Yeah, or people like to say the size of Manhattan with, yeah, with the mass of a star, so like crazy dense. What's, what's the minimum maximum uh, mass you're supporting? So there are theoretical limits. Yes. <laughs> so if you have... Okay, so the minimum mass for a neutron star is something like one and a half solar masses because anything that's smaller than that is a white dwarf, basically. So then, so white dwarfs are these slightly bigger, they're like Earth size, but sun mass things um, that are uh, also degenerate, but they are like, they're kept up by what's called electron degeneracy. And with white dwarfs, we actually understand how they work. So you can, we, we, we know like if they're this mass, then they're this size. With neutron stars, we're not really sure. So we think they're made out of neutrons. That's why they're called neutron stars. But they could still be made out of quarks or something like strange stars or whatever. There are a whole bunch of different theories. And exactly how the radius relates to the mass depends on, on your theory of, of what the neutron star is made of. So what people are trying to do is, is get really good measurements of the mass and the radius of a neutron star and then figure out, okay, can we rule out this weird theory. Can we rule out that weird theory? A couple of the weird ones have been ruled out, have but more or less. Yet, or Sorry? So a few. So I think the most massive neutron star that we know of is, okay, I may go wrong here. It's like two and a half-ish. So we think the, like the, the most massive that any of these theories predicts like three solar masses, but we haven't seen anything that massive. Um, and then, but it's really hard to measure the radius of a neutron star, and it's it's even harder to measure both the radius and the mass. So, uh, yeah, we're working on it. Yeah, so <laughs> th this last year, for the first time, um, more than 50% of Hawaiians support the construction of TMT, or 30-meter telescope in Hawaii. Um, and as of, I think, like a week or two weeks ago, the Hawaii Supreme Court uh, officially ruled that the construction can go forward, and basically they've granted like the building permit um, to the 
uh, the observatory site. So it, it, it's moving forward. Um, Yeah, and a lot of considerations were also taken into account in finding a good location for the TMT on Mauna Kea. Um, so as, uh, look, there was a, a huge study to make sure that the, the site that was chosen for this telescope was on a location where there was no, um, like, any remains or anything found in that area. And so it was, um, uh, like, in, like, in accordance with, as, with like, to the, um, as, as much as possible with what the natives um, would prefer, um, and also uh, as part of sort of like a concession in building this giant telescope, several, I think like four other telescopes are being taken down as well. So there's kind of like a put one up, take uh, so X telescopes uh, down to sort of balance that trade with the natives. So the ones that are taken down are obsolete. Some of them are, I think, or just are going to be outclassed by these new ones, yeah. Yeah, so there are a lot of these really strange planets. Um, actually, the first confirmed planet um, was sort of a Jupiter-sized thing with an orbital period of four days, which is, like, optimal conditions for, like, discovery purposes, but, like, for, you know, vacationing on a planet somewhere, that's, that's kind of ridiculous to think about orbiting your star every four days. Um, and the, the big question is, how the heck did that planet, or like there's a whole population of these things that we see because they're easy to detect, um, but how do they even get where they are? And so there's questions of, do they form that close to the star and, you know, the star doesn't totally destroy the planet or blow off its atmosphere? Does the planet evolve or, you know, be constructed somewhere further away from the star where it can get to sort of like, you know, a Jupiter in a sort of solar system-like condition? And then some crazy thing happens where it migrates and you know, ends up in a final orbit very close to its star where it has some interaction um, with another planet or something that causes it to, to move forward in or um, current research is trying to find out. Stay tuned. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so you could think of a situation where you would have two sort of 
main objects in this uh, central accretion disk that's being formed, and one becomes large enough to become a star and the other doesn't quite reach that point, and uh, the, um, the name for those types of objects would be like brown dwarfs, um, where there's these large sort of bigger than Jupiter but not big enough to be a star. Um, those, could, those probably exist somewhere, but um, I don't know how likely that would create a Jupiter that is, you know, that close to, a, to its host or something like that. dark energy. <laughs> I mean, we don't know what it is, but, and it's not even like a, an object that you can think of. As far as we, like, we don't even know if it's energy, we just can't see it. And it is this weird thing that makes the universe expand at an accelerating rate. And, you know, that's one of the, the main questions of the century. Uh, one of the um, famous quotes by the guy who coined the term dark energy was, this is a 22nd century problem discovered in the 19th century, or in the 20th century. Um, so a lot of uh, advancements are going to be needed to, to figure out what the heck this thing is because it makes up over 90 or 70 percent of our universe. Yeah, I think the merging black holes was, was a pretty good one, the merging neutron star. But that's mainly, I guess, because of the gravitational wave bit that people have been working for decades to get the thing to work and that they actually see what they expected to see. Um, and then, so the next step in sort of that line of research is going to be LISA. Uh, so that's the large laser interferometer in space, basically, right? So LIGO, but then three satellites that are sort of flying information 150,000 kilometers apart. Um, that's going to do the same thing, but then for supermassive, merging supermassive black holes. That's going to be awesome. So I actually think a pretty cool object that is technically Marianne's area of research, uh, not black holes, but they're called U U ULX pulsars. So um, in other galaxies, we see very, very bright X-ray sources uh, that are not associated with the centers of these galaxies. And so these X-rays are not coming from like a central supermassive black hole. But uh, we thought that they were, you know, these sort of intermediate mass size black holes. Um, but some of them actually pulse. And so they're actually pulsars, uh, so rapidly rotating neutron stars. And what's really interesting about these objects are they are so luminous, you know, they're really bright in the x-rays and they're extra galactic. And, um, you know, we have, like, uh, physics tells us that, you know, uh, these objects are accreting and are so luminous that they're ex exceeding the sort of Eddington ratio. So, you know, normally um, any sort of object, astrophysical object, um, has this balance between the gravitational attraction and then the sort of radiation pressure that's acting on it from uh, the photons that are impacting on uh, a particle. And uh, we just can't explain how these, these, these pulsars are just so incredibly uh, luminous that they're, they're many, many, many orders of magnitude above the Eddington limit. And so I think it's really interesting how uh, there are all these different theories out there of how can you get these super Eddington um, accreting uh, neutron stars and how they basically work. So 
So yeah, ULXs are actually even within the high energy astrophysical community a very uh, new and up and coming thing. Not 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 like every X ray astronomer even knows about them. Um, and they were they the first few ULXs that were discovered. Uh, I think the first one was like in 2014 uh, using um, some. <laughs> um, but yeah, so th there have been X-ray satellites that have uh, picked up basically pulsations from the light curves of these um, objects that show that they are neutron stars and not just black holes. Um, so the thing, with GRBs, I think, are brighter in like in an absolute sense, but they are very short. Uh, so they they emit a lot of energy in a very short time. These. Yes, uh, so gamma ray bursts, sorry. So those are usually detected in gamma rays, uh, hence the name, but they're like, they last a fraction of a second or some, I think maybe a few seconds, and they're probably um, either colliding neutron stars or collapsing uh, a, a, a certain type of supernova, a certain type of collapsing star we think causes these gamma ray bursts. So they're extremely energetic, but they're extremely short-lived. Ultraluminous X-ray sources, they're not the brightest thing around because these supermassive black holes, they get much, much brighter. Um, it's just that sort of uh, relative to how massive the thing is that is that is accreting all the matter, they're extreme. Because these, yeah. So there's this, there's this sort of relation between how bright you can be and how massive you are. And these, so supermassive black holes are really, really massive. They can get really, really bright. And these ultra-luminous X-ray sources are just way too bright for their mass, basically. Did you have your most interesting? Um, I just added a little bit. So one of the things that I find the most interesting are uh, the first stars. So we have never detected these, and whether we ever will is also, I think, up to debate. So even something like the 30-meter telescope um, which is going to have a uh, much larger light collecting power than our current telescopes won't be able to detect these objects in the early universe. Um, so, right, there was a time in the universe when stars did not exist, um, and they had to start forming at some point. And the first stars in the universe, we think, were very different from the stars that we see today. And it's mostly because the chemical composition of the gas in the early universe was very different. Um, so the chemical composition was mostly just uh, hydrogen and helium. Because everything else, you know, again, this is going back to why we call the everything else metals. Everything else is made in uh, processes that relate to stellar evolution. So you need stars first, right? So how did you get them? Um, so just based on our understanding of how like gas clouds gravitationally collapse and the and things like that and based on the composition of the cloud we think these things had to be like really massive um, in order to be able to gravitationally collapse so they they were huge stars compared to what we have now and they they may have exploded and ended their lives in very different ways as a consequence so um, we think that since they're such unique objects, although we can't directly detect them, that they might leave unique signatures in terms of the um, elements that they produce when they die. And then we hope that, you know, that these signatures are incorporated into the very next generation of stars. So people are actively looking for these stars that would be the very next generation and looking for these very unique signatures to try to learn more about um, these first objects. But I guess it would be cool if, you know, maybe I would be like really old if I was even alive, but if we <laughs> were somehow able to detect light from the first stars. So the question is on the formation of our solar system. And yeah, so I guess this question is, have, 
Has our sun drifted from the place where it was born? For what kind of planets? Hypervelocity. Hypervelocity? Yeah. So I'm not sure I understand what this refers to. Oh, yeah. So there are um, lots of planets that we call sort of like free-floating planets that are so don't really have a star that they're attached to. They're just sort of flying through space or wherever. Hmm? Rogue planets. <laughs> yeah. Rogue planets, homeless planets, free-floating <laughs> planets. Um, yeah, so for those, right, you can't watch them transit their star because they have no star that they're going around. Um, you can't do a sort of a Doppler measurement because you don't have that anything to look at for a wobble. They're just kind of flying through space. Um, what you can do, and this takes it's a very chance alignment, but you can have this free-floating rogue planet flying through the galaxy, and it can pass in front um, uh, of a background star, and then that light from that star, uh, because of relativity, will be gravitationally lensed, sort of around the same way that light can be lensed around a black hole. Although the mass of a planet is much smaller than the mass of a black hole, so this effect is really, really small. Um, so it's called microlensing. And you can look at, basically, all these stars um, and just watch for this signature for the star to sort of uh, flare up in brightness in this very well-defined shape from relativity. and if you can sort of measure like how much that star flares up and sort of how long that goes for, you can kind of infer what the size of the object was that flew in front of this star, but it only happens once. You're not gonna you know, have it happen once every orbit or something. So it's sort of like a one and done. We saw something, there's probably a planet of this size you know, in that direction. So. Yeah, so, so um, I don't know the exact number of planets that have been detected in this manner. Um, my hunch would be somewhere in like the hundred, couple hundreds, or even fewer. I don't know if Michael knows <laughs> how many microlensing planets there are. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so you can get how heavy it is by how much the light is flared off, because that will determine the, the strength of the lensing effect. Um, 
but because they're so far away, they're basically unable to resolve the actual size in any sort of measurement. Um, so I mostly threw that up because there, there's this one quote that I really like, which is, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess to anything. <laughs> and so, I mean, this, this is, you know, we, 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 we're studying these really interesting problems and, you know, trying to discover remarkable things about the universe. But what that means is every day we are typing away code at our laptops and, you know, trying to extract this information from our, measure, from our measurements. So, um, that is a whole business in of itself. Um, and it, it's tricky to deal with large quantities of data effectively and efficiently um, once that sort of scales beyond what your technology can handle. So like upcoming 